you were living in New York when you made this film, right? Right. Okay. And yeah. how did you meet Susan? I, it was funny because I was sitting, what I remember is that I was at a play that a friend of mine was in, but it was a play where there were about, about 10 people in the audience because yeah. you basically wouldn't go to the play unless you knew somebody that was in it. So <laughs> somebody that was working with Susan saw me in the audience and said, I think she'd be right for the, for the part and then called me and asked me if I wanted to audition and if I could, if I was an actress or anything, was the last question. <laughs> were so, you an actress? Had you yeah, been I mean, I had, I had gone to NYU. I was studying acting, so yeah. That's pretty serendipitous. I mean, because she, she was in school at NYU, right? She was in school at NYU. Yeah. And it kind of, I mean, anybody that was at this play would probably have been in, the, some, in theater or something, uh -huh. you know, yeah. And so, so you, so she called you and you met and she had the script already or what was She the? called and I auditioned, I remember she made me audition about 10 times different, what? but she had, it was a completely different script and we were working on it and we were doing, it, it, uh, it first was kind of like a, sort of a breakfast at Tiffany's kind of thing where this young, like free spirit meets a, a, a middle-aged art dealer <laughs> And who's really rich and has this, and that's what it was. That's what the movie was. And then we were doing an improvisation, and I fell off of, as we were doing it, I fell out of a building <laughs> and, bro and, and broke my ankle. And I was in a cast for four months. And during that time, they were able to look at everything that it, the whole script, and they were able to rewrite it, and it turned into what it is. Oh, what I it ended up being. I'd read about you breaking your leg, which yeah. I'm so sorry, that's awful. But it, but it led to, I didn't realize that it led to a complete reworking of the script. It was a complete, it was a chance to look at everything and think, this is not working at all. And just to refigure the whole thing, and that's what happened. And that's when Richard Hell came in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. What was it like working with him? I mean, he was kind of, he kind of had a cult of personality around him at that point, right? Yeah. And, and this, I mean, this character is sort of, if Richard Hell and the Voidoids like hadn't made it, yeah. he's kind of that, a version of that character. And there were a lot of people like that in yeah. those days that were kind of like that. But when I found out that he was gonna be in it, I was a huge fan. So I was completely terrified. And I remember when he started, I, was, I, was, I, I couldn't even talk to him. Like it was so scary. But, um, but then he ended up just being a really, you know, a nice guy. He looks scary. He was a little, I mean, in those days, I think he had a you know, he <laughs> <does>. problems. <laughs> but he's, he's, he, but he, he was interesting. I mean, it was, he, he was exciting, you know. But also very supportive and very sweet. So he wasn't at all kind of mean or, or you know, edgy or anything like that. And, the, and Cookie Mueller is, I, I didn't realize the, the film that you both go, that you and, that yeah. Susan, or that um, Ren and Paul go to watch together is a film that Susan shot for this yeah. film, right? Yeah, so, yeah. And Cook, it's Cookie Mueller that's it's, so great. I know, and then did you, did anybody see that Chris Noth was one of the prostitutes? <laughs> which, <laughs> which is pretty incredible. Yeah. And so this is a, Kind of, this is a version of New York. You lived there for how long after? I lived there lived? for, um, I guess, maybe about five years after. And then, I, and then I moved to California, and we would spend half the year in New York and half the year in California for a long time. But, um, but I've always gone back to New York, and my daughter lives there, so... It's a yeah. very different New York City now. It's completely different. I mean, it's, you know, it's really easy to... I mean, it was a very, very exciting time because the city was, because the city was bankrupt, it was like there was nowhere to go but up. And every, everything was cheap. And if you didn't like your apartment, you could stay there for a week and then move. And it was completely different than it is now. And it was, um, you know, it was a really great place. But on the other hand, it was also very dangerous. Yeah. So you can romanticize it like a lot of kids do now. But it's, it was also like almost everybody I knew was held up or, you know, you know, mugged or, you know, all, all kinds of terrible things. Yeah, and it's, that's kind of why I think this film is so unique and interesting because it's, it's one of the few narratives, especially from that time where you see a woman trying to navigate yeah. that dangerous world. And it's kind of just taken for granted that Paul, for example, can sleep in his van. Right. And he's fine and no one's going to bother him. And if they do, it's like a friendly prostitute. Right. But for, yeah. for Ren, she's, she's bouncing all over the place and she's really in a lot of danger that she doesn't seem to 
acknowledge. Yeah. I think that was kind of true of the time, though. I don't think that this character was that far off the way a lot of people were. She was maybe a little extreme, but I think that there were a lot of um, people that, you know, hanging out in crazy parts of town at all hours of the night, and there was always something going on. And it was always, um, you know, just, it was fun, but, it was, but you were kind of taking your life in your hands, and I think for some reason, we all thought that was great. You know, <laughs> that, that community still yeah. was. A there were a lot of people in New York that didn't think that was great. But yeah. downtown at this particular, you know, where, where I lived, yeah. it was considered, you know, kind of a fun thing. But I think back on it, I'm surprised that we all survived. You know, it was pretty crazy. It's pretty it's pretty incredible. And I mean, the that lot where he was where Paul's van is by the West Side Highway. Yeah. Is now where Trump plays Trump is. Tower. Yeah. 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 Are yeah. you kidding? It was That's... better before. <laughs> <laughs> it was better with Much graffiti better. and burning yeah. tires. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh my yeah. gosh. And I mean, the, the other interesting, so the Peppermint Lounge yeah. had moved around a couple times, right? I mean, it, it was further uptown and then it moved. That's right. That iteration where you were shooting was closer to Union Square, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And was it, did you just shut the place down to go in and shoot? Because I know you weren't really... You didn't really have permits, I don't think. We didn't have permits anywhere. I mean, yeah. we were constantly being chased all over the town. You know, we were, I mean, we were on the subway. When I think about those faces, those close-up of people, they, they didn't, they they didn't, didn't sign it. anything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they were just like, you know, but they, but it, we were just, um, we really were chased all over New York. You know, we weren't allowed to be on the subway, so we would try to get shots and then, you know, get chased off. And then I remember there was a prop guy that was the, the gun that's in the movie. He was standing in Times Square, uh, just holding it, waiting for a scene. <laughs> and suddenly we looked, and he was surrounded by cops. And, you know, so it was, a, it was we didn't, I think there wasn't, a, it was like a bunch of people just trying to make a movie, really. I mean, Susan really was a pro and knew what she was doing, although it was her first movie. But it was all done, like, stealth. I think when when the cops surrounded him, was there kind of like a like a tacit agreement to just all leave and yeah. like let him deal with it? We, he was left completely alone. Yeah. we didn't. <laughs> he got no help from anybody. <laughs> I mean, so. for the production, it makes sense. Yeah, right? for the production to keep going. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we just had to be like, okay. So yeah, it was crazy. Uh, and and again, like back to the club scene, I'm just really fixated on that for some mm -hmm. reason because it was it was such a like vibrant place and yeah. there's there's like bands performing and there's very I mean there's very clear dialogue recorded in there so were you in there after hours or probably you know yeah. it's it's so long ago that I can't really yeah. remember yeah. for all I know it was a Sunday afternoon no I guess it was night but the the exterior shots could have been at night but the interior I don't even remember mm -hmm. it probably was early in the morning or something I mean I'm because those places um we usually had some. They usually had something going on every night, so I'm not sure exactly how we did that. I don't. I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the, I mean, it's very, very clearly this was intended to be a female character. But when you and Susan kind of got together initially, um, I guess during the reworking phase, mm -hmm. were you a part of that? The reworking of the script, and then, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I guess the follow-up to that is just, did you, did you focus on the fact that she was how important it was that she's kind of unsympathetic. <laughs> you know, it's so interesting. Yeah. Um, we, I, I don't think that, I mean, hopefully, well, first of all, I, I didn't have a lot to do with, I, I didn't sit with her and, and, I mean, it's really her thing. I mean, she really came up with it. And then, I, and then one of the writers is Ron Nicewanner, who writes a lot of like, I think he, I, I can't remember what show he works on. Oh, but, What's that show I'm always saying he works on? Uh, Homeland. Homeland. Yeah, he's one of the producers of Homeland, and he writes episodes, and I'm like, God, he's really a great writer. And so the dialogue, I thought, was actually pretty good. And, um, but yeah, this was really Susan's idea, but when she told me what it was going to be, I was so happy, because it made it, you know, it just seemed so much more fun, and we could really be more ourselves, even though I was nothing like that character, but still, we could, you know, be like characters that were around us. You were nothing like that character, but you still like you knew you knew that scene. Sort I of. knew the scene, and I lived in the East Village, and I, um, I mean, I guess I, I used to go to clubs all the time. I mean, what everybody did then, we would go to like the Mud Club, and then we'd come out, and it would be morning, and we'd have breakfast at Dave's Luncheonette. 
So, and everybody, and they were open, to, they were open all night. So, I mean, all the clubs, we'd come out around 10 a.m. So that's, that's basically what we did. But I was, you know, I mean, I wasn't like that character at all because I was very shy and I was kind of, you know, I was a lot more reticent about things than this, this person was. I, th I think it captures this really interesting transition between, sort of between punk rock and new wave, yeah. maybe before new wave was even defined. Yeah. Um, and so the, the fashion is like a very specific moment that really only existed for like two years, that like maybe Blondie was yeah. influential in bringing about. It was, it was a, it was a very um, short period of time yeah. when it was like this. And I felt like Susan, in a way, art, she kind of art directed New York because everything was really colorful and vibrant, but she made it even more so. I mean, there was a lot of spray painting that was already, some, a lot of it was already there, but it was, um, it was like New York heightened. Yeah, even some of the, the, a lot of the interiors, the colors are just incredible. Yeah. yeah, the last version, the last time I saw this, I think was like on my laptop and the colors on that print yeah. are just incredible, like the interiors, and you see that carry over actually into Desperately Seeking Susan. That's true. The colors in that movie are just. Yeah, Insane. that's that. Yeah, I I think that this was really kind of like the template for that. Like I can really see that there was a jumping off point to that other movie. And then they all kind of coalesce into your character in making Mr. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like in one body. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Um, well, I think we can go to the audience. Sure. Does anybody uh, anybody out there have any questions? We have microphones that we can run around. Um, oh, all the way up in the back there. Um, you, so you open by speaking about falling out of a building while doing improv. And I'm very curious from the type of training you guys were having at NYU and the specificity of this kind of production, how that sort of technique was integrated, how much the improv became part of the character discovery process. I don't know if you can sort of speak to that technique a little bit. Well, the... Um, we did a lot of improvisation in, in the movie. I mean, the, it's all scripted, but we did a lot of rehearsing and, and um, improvisation. So it was, I mean, I have to say, for me, because I was kind of still in school when I did it, my, whatever technique I had was basically trying to just get over sheer terror. But, the, but, what, um, but what happened in this particular uh, improvisation that we were doing when the accident happened, we were with the guy. We were at the rich art dealer's loft, and you know the character that was playing the rich art dealer, and um, like a European guy, kind of a Lothario, and we were, and Susan had us do this exercise where his objective was to get me out of there at all costs, and my objective was to stay, and then she kind of whispered in our ear, even though it was like a one on one exercise, so. He was, so we were acting, and he picked me up and put me out, and he, this was his loft, the guy, it was actually his loft. He put me out on his fire escape, and then closed all the doors, but we were still acting. And so I was like knocking on the window, and <laughs> I took a step back. And, and I was, all, I, I heard somebody scream in the street, and I looked down, and I'd fallen to the next floor. And so um, that's what happened, so that's. <laughs> But um, but in terms of technique, that's it's interesting. We did a lot of uh, a lot of improv, and we did a lot of uh, you know. There was a lot of input into how the scenes were going to go, so I think there was, you know, there was that kind of thing. Uh, in the middle up here. Oh wait, can you wait for the microphone to come? Sorry, thanks. Oh, I was wondering to what degree the improv made its way into the finished script. I was thinking specifically of that wonderful scene <clears throat> with the prostitute who offers Paul her chicken sandwich. Yeah. And that had a, a particular type of humor that wasn't in the rest of the script you know, almost. And I wondered if, if that yeah. person had contributed that, those you, lines. You know what? I don't know. I wasn't there when they shot that, but I, I really do feel like that's the best scene in the movie. And I feel like it's, and I feel like there is something about it that just really works, and I'm not sure how it came about, really. 
I have a feeling it was, um, it really seems like a Susan Seidelman scene though. There is something about it that is so her sensibility that I have a feeling that it was scripted, but probably they kind of took off a little on the dialogue like we all did. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Um, I, I was curious, uh, going back to, I mean, the, like that this shoot probably necessitated a really small crew, especially the yeah. on the street stuff. So the, but the point where I like noticed it the most was toward the very end when you're, you're wearing this, the pink coat on the subway. And I just, ima like I, it, I had this like Im imagination that it was maybe just you and Susan on the train together. Is that pretty accurate? Or did you have like a lighting guy helping too? Or? There was usually, I think there were, uh, usually there was, her cousin, who kind of did crowd control, the same guy with the gun, and he ha always had the worst jobs. Like he always, <laughs> and so he was constantly. And then um, there was the the cameraman, and Susan and me, and that was it. So yeah, it was very. It had to be like a really, really small kind of. Um, you know, we had to be practically invisible. Yeah, I'm sure. I, yeah. Well, it's nice. She was shooting on 16, right? Yes. So that camera is a little a little smaller than maybe maybe a. A full-on. Yeah, um, it was rig. 16, and then it was blown yeah. up to 35 for the Cannes Film Festival. What was Cannes like? It was really great. It was well. First of all, it, just really quickly, I, this I think is an amazing little thing. There, um, it was in 16, and Susan had sent a copy of it to the Cannes Film Festival, and they got back to her and they said, you know, we really liked it, but we'd like to see, but you know, too bad it's not in 35, or if you can put it, in, and she didn't have the money to do it, and apparently it was incredibly expensive. And she was sitting with a friend talking about it in a coffee shop, and a guy at the next table said, wait, can Film Festival wants your movie? Well, I'm from a film company, and show it to us, and if we like it, we'll blow it up for you. And they did, and that's how it got in. Did they charge? They didn't charge her? No, they didn't charge her That's anything. Amazing. Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah. And so you two went together. We went together. Yeah. And um, we, uh, it, we, you know, we, you know, that you have this grand thing up the steps, and everybody was kind of pushing us aside, trying to see like who, <laughs> like <laughs> where somebody that they knew who they were, were was. But it was fun. I mean, we had a great time at Cannes. Um, so it was, you know, it was very exciting. It was unexpected. Did you notice? Did you notice a, a difference? I guess in her, uh, in her attitude or style between this and the second film that you made with her, which was about five years later, yeah. and a bit, I mean, not not huge Hollywood movie, but definitely like yeah. not as not a forty thousand dollar independent right. production like this was. Yeah, I think that she. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think that the. Production values changed, and you know she was able to work with actors that were a lot more experienced, which was great. But I also feel like um, it was still her. There's something of her that's very, very distinctive that goes through all of her movies that I think is really that I think is really great. Yeah. Well, we were really happy to feature this film tonight and have you here. Oh, thank so, you. Yeah, thank you so much. I think uh, I think we're going to wrap it up. All right, great. Yeah. Thank you so much all for right. coming. Thank, thank you all for coming tonight.